Okay, I can go back to, there we go. I'll go back to McCulloch and Pitts, yeah? I mean, is it recording? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. So in 1943, uh, McCulloch and Pitts, one's a, a, a logician, the other's a neurophysiologist. They write this article in which they argue that the very structure of the brain, the human brain, all brains, very structure of the nervous system has a logical basis that the way that synapses are organized synapses are the points at which two neurons come into contact the very way they're organized um, produces logic gates if or then and not and so on now neurophysiologists and neuroanatomists took long look, look at this and said this is rubbish this isn't how neuro nervous systems are built and they were right it's not but von neumann because this was the world of the beginning of cybernetics of people trying to think about behavior and brains in uh, this new way. Von Neumann took this idea and went to the US government with it. The US government had charged him with building a, a digital computer. And he said, right, I'm going to build you this computer. And this is actually written in his document, but I'm going to build it like a brain. I'm going to build it like McCulloch and Pitts tell me that the brain is constructed. So in other words, although we now think that the, the brain is like a computer, at the beginning, the computer was like a brain. Now, that's the metaphor that we still are operating under. It's changed a bit, but basically we still think that the brain represents in some way the outside world, uh, that it performs various kind of calculations, uh, that it enable it to predict what will happen when certain things happen or if it were to make a, a particular behavior to take place. Uh, and then it tries to, it, so it's got a model of the outside world and tries to predict what will happen and then organizes the behavior of the animal in an appropriate way to uh, increase whatever outcome it's interested in, finding food, finding sex, finding somewhere safe to sleep, whatever it might be. Um, and the second half of the book deals with this apparently contradictory idea. So we've made in the last 70 years since this metaphor became dominant, we have made in incredible discoveries. We know so much more than they did. And yet we fundamentally don't have a different paradigm, a different metaphor. Us, we have the same approach as we've had for the last 70 years. Now, you might say, well, that doesn't really matter if it works and if it's right. Um, that's the case, obviously, for Newtonian physics, which in the world that it deals with is absolutely fine. It doesn't work on the quantum level, but uh, you know, for, for putting satellites around Mars, that's fine. So, but the problem is that in the last 70 years, it has become in repeatedly apparent that we don't we've got more and more data about so many things but we don't know what to do with those those data we don't know how to interpret them we don't have a theory of what is going on indeed some neuroscientists challenge even those things that i said were accepted like something something like representation so okay so things are represented in the brain to whom this is what daniel dennett the philosopher said <laughs> He said, if you say it's represented, then something must be looking at, you know, we're getting back to the idea of having a mini man, you know, got a mini -man gonna... watching our screen. So that's not right. So some there are some neuroscientists who argue that even representation isn't isn't accurate. I, 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 I think that's wrong. I think that is a legitimate way of there's a parallel between the activity of sensory systems, for example, and uh, the visual world, the auditory world, the taste world, the sm sense, smell world, and so on. But anyway, so there we've got this problem. And that's really the kind of the, 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 the crux of the book is that we don't understand how the brain works. Uh, you know, we don't have a, a theory that there's a push with all the uh, with all the uh, localization of function done through those fMRI scans, there's a, a pressure to end up with an idea that was called phrenology, which was very, very popular throughout the 19th century. You can find phrenology in virtually every 19th century novel. When Sherlock Holmes first meets Moriarty, his arch enemy, uh, 
uh, and this was written in the 1880s, uh, Moriarty is very rude about Holmes because of the shape of his head. And phrenology believed, that they thought that you could tell the shape of somebody's brain by feeling their head. You can't, but anyway. Uh, and if you could feel the shape of their brain, then you knew something about their personality. So it's a bit like astrology. You know, it's, it's, it's pseudoscience, but a lot of people liked it. Novelists wrote about it. So even if you think about it, this idea that there's this bit of your brain lighting up when you, something happens, what does that actually tell you? Does it? I mean, it says something is happening there. That doesn't mean to say the thing you're interested in is happening there. It's simply saying there's a correlation. There's something going on when somebody is thinking of playing table tennis or something, you know. And part of the problem is throughout the history of neuroscience, this isn't so much about the metaphor, but just about our understanding from the very beginnings in the uh, when people really got quite good brain anatomy in the middle of the 19th century. There's been this tension over whether function is localized or distributed. And clearly the computer metaphor says, well, it's localized. <laughs> Right. Because my camera's there and my microphone is here and that is a localized function. And I've got a I've got a, you know, a board that does one thing will calculate, you know, so that the computer is incredibly highly localized. If you break your, uh, your 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 image processing chip, then your computer doesn't work anymore. Whatever. Yeah. You break the CPU. It's dead. But the brain's different. And there has always been this evidence of plasticity. And in the 19th century, the middle of the 19th century, people became began to the evidence that there was localization of function came from what I'm doing now. We're back to Galen from speech. So uh, a French uh, neuroanatomist uh, called Broca, he discovered that uh, patients who had a stroke, who uh, couldn't speak as a result of their stroke when they died and he looked at their brain he found degeneration in the left hand side of the brain here this area which is known as Broca's area and eventually it became widespread accepted that this is the air and this is where Galen's nerve goes of course they Galen's nerve which goes all the way around there to the larynx is up here so speech the production of speech is controlled by this part of your brain and that's one of the reasons why if somebody suddenly starts slurring their speech and they're not drunk or whatever, then they should go to a hospital very quickly because they probably had a stroke, especially if they're quite old. Yeah, because it's quite often that it happens there. And this is generally accepted and it's one of the few solid pieces of localization of function. You can see on the Internet, uh, if you're on YouTube, uh, experiments where you get people who get an electromagnet, a very powerful magnet. And they put it on the side of their head. Doesn't do them any harm, but they'll start reciting some poetry. And they, you put this electromagnet on their skull, which therefore alters the activity of the neurons, and they can't speak. They start, blah, 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 you know, they can't make any sound anymore. So all that's very, very powerful evidence. And yet, just recently, a woman in her early 40s who went to college in the USA. So it's perfectly normal, been through the whole of her life quite normally. She's recently been scanned and she has no front left part of her brain at all. What I think happened was that she had a stroke when she was still in the womb. So all that part of her brain doesn't exist. And yet she can speak and function quite normally. In other words, something that we think is immutable and localized has clearly got a very strong genetic basis that that's what humans do we've got this up here it controls our speech if it's damaged early enough then plasticity takes over and the brain wants to learn how to speak it you know because she was spoken to when she was little and we're you know anybody who's had a, a baby or knows a small child knows that they just soak up language that's how they can learn language all these different languages you know uh children just easy no problem for us old people it's horrible but when you're young you can learn any language lots of them your brain is built that way but what this shows is that it there's that plasticity is even extends to the fundamental thing of you know the neurons involved in controlling speech 
So we're back to localization and distribution. Even something like uh, the visual cortex. So this is at the back of the skull. And if you damage it, you can lose your sight. If you stimulate it, you will see things. Um, but right from the very beginning, when this was investigated by people called Hubel and Wiesel in the 1950s, they were studying cats. And so they have a cat which is anaesthetized, but its eyes are open. Um, and they've got electrodes in the visual cortex. And they are presenting uh, various bits of visual images, uh, dots and moving dots and so on, and recording from parts of the uh, visual cortex. That's the, you know, you've got your neurons here going up wire into the back of your brain, just one synapse. It's a straight readout of what's in your eyes. And yet, even then, they discovered that there were neurons in there, in the visual cortex, that in fact came from the auditory cortex, from the bit dealing with your brain. And these were nuancing and altering the activity of the way that those the visual signals were processed. So in other words, even something as localized as vision is not completely localized and isn't actually quite you know, pure. It's not like your computer. It's like you've got your, your camera and your microphone completely entangled. And the reason for this, if you're a cat, is very straightforward. If you're a cat, you're interested in movement. But what you really, really like is movement and a rustling sound. You know, if you've got some leaves and the mouse moves under it, then you're going to go absolutely nothing. You can try anybody with a cat can try this at home. Yeah, it works very well. You make a noise, you move. They are really excited. And this happens immediately at the very first stages of processing. So, you know, there is localization of function, but it's distributed as well. And there is distribution, but it has a localized element. So even these very simple ideas of localization and distributed function are turning out to be really complicated. Um, you know, what, one of the arguments against localization of function was, in particular with the visual system, was, which was very popular when I was a student, was the idea of the grandmother cell. This is to do with a rather complicated joke that I won't go into. But the idea is, if you've got a cell that recognizes every an object so you've got you can imagine that because we've got billions and billions of brain cells so that you could have a kind of hierarchical way of organ and seeing the world you've got you know detectors of lines of corners and you could imagine that these in a hierarchical way would go assemble then to form a, a square or another image you know and the activity of that neuron would correspond to a square or an image or ultimately the implication would be of anything you could recognize including your grandmother and if you can got a cell that recognizes your grandmother, then you must also have a, another cell that can recognize your grandmother standing on a head because you still recognize her or your grandmother standing on a head riding a donkey. It's still your grandmother. And so clearly this is absurd. This is why it was, you know, this was a ridiculous argument. So clearly it wasn't true. Or was it? Because um, in 2010, some uh, patients who were going to have uh, brain surgery to deal with their very severe epilepsy. They very kindly allowed neuroscientists before they had the operation to poke around and record from single cells, so single cells in their brain, in their visual areas of their brain. And they then showed them lots and lots of images. Um, and they found in one patient, a, one cell, one cell was only interested in a picture of the actress Jennifer Aniston. Another cell in another patient was only interested in the Sydney Opera House. Uh, the Jennifer Aniston cell wasn't interested if there were pictures of Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt, who was her boyfriend at the time. Maybe he is now. I don't know. I don't keep up with these things. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, it was it, only Jennifer Aniston were they interested, interested in. So this looks, it's quite bizarre. Uh, to show it's not all rubbish, um, somebody else who was a mathematician or an engineer, I can't remember, one of the patients was an engineer. He had one cell that recognised a differential equation. And that was all it was interested in. You could show it the Sydney Opera House, didn't care. You could show it uh, a piece of writing, it didn't care. Differential equation, yes, it liked that. So this looks very alarming. This suggests that maybe we have got cells for our grandmother 
upside down playing the banjo on a horse or whatever. But in fact, it's uh, you've got to be very careful when you hear this kind of evidence. So what they had done, you've got to remember, is they're recording from a single cell. But that cell is connected to a, a whole millions, millions of other cells. And really, all they've done is said, well, visual symbols have a representation or visual objects have a representation in the brain, which they do, which is kind of the, the starting point of neuroscience. Everything we feel and think and imagine, you know, see and sense is based on the activity of neurons. That's all there is. There's nothing else. There's no spirit. There's no little man in there. That's our challenge. That's the challenge in neuroscience, going back to your first question, to understand that. And it's very, very difficult, as I say. So really, all they've done is by pure accident, they had recorded from one of the many, many neurons that represented Jennifer Aniston in one patient or a completely different set of neurons, which in another patient represented the Sydney Opera House. And lots and lots of neurons would have represent, responded to that. Some parts of it would have re responded both to Jennifer Aniston and perhaps to a random blonde woman who looked a bit like her, you know. Um, and we now know from studies of animals that these representations, that this interpretation is right, that it's not just kind of single cells in a hierarchy, but it's part of a network. But the intriguing thing is these representations, these networks corresponding, say, to Jennifer Aniston or not what you give a mouse, you give a mouse a more a simpler image, a square, a black square with a white triangle behind it or something. Those representations exist, but they're different in different animals. So it's not the same set of cells. And above all, they change with time. So our brains are plastic. Even the representation of things like the Sydney Opera House, which is fairly kind of constant. And if you know what it looks like, you know what it looks like. Um, that's changing. So those neurons are changing, their patterns of activity is being altered. And yet there is, so we've got localization, but we've also got a distributed function. And it's distributed not only in space, but it's distributed in time as well. So there you go, it's really complicated. Well, sir, if two neurons are exactly similar to each other, and if one of them is recognizing Jennifer Aniston and another one is not, that there has to be something in their function or their connection only, which yeah, can distinguish. Yeah, but those they, it, they are not the only cells that respond. That just happens exactly. to be the only cell they recorded from. Yeah, And there is not a place in the brain that corresponds to Jennifer Aniston in you and me and that patient. There is, you know, we can recognize millions of faces. Some of us like me aren't very good. I'm very bad at recognizing faces. Um, but the representation in our brains of those of those images of those concepts ultimately because maybe that's what it is so the the sydney opera house cell for example responded both to a picture but also to the words sydney opera house so that would suggest that that whole set of neurons that they were recording from represented in some way the concept and that's what they were picking up. So there, that means it's they've got the, the concept neurons and they must be connected to neurons that can recognize pictures, a picture of the Sydney Opera House, uh, and then other neurons that can recognize letters and interpret them. Uh, goodness me, <laughs> it's complicated. Sir, uh, the thing about the relation between computer and the brain, if you read the articles by John van Neumann, he constantly refers to the computer as an organism. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So th this was part of his plan. And uh, the, 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 as I said, these called these, this is called cybernetics. Uh, a whole world was invented in the middle of the 1940s. Again, it's all linked with the war. So uh, Norbert Wiener, the great mathematician, and um, uh, Shannon, another great mathematician, they both come up with the mathematical concept of information at the same time. They're working on uh, military projects for the US government. And they have slightly different concepts of, of uh, what information is. So their maths isn't the same. But uh, uh, Shannon writes a really complicated book, which is still in print, and is still read by biologists in particular who use these ideas, um, called the inform information, mathem the mathematical theory of information. The theory of communication. Yeah. And uh, Norbert Wiener, 
writes a popular book, which is full of equations. I mean, many of them are badly printed as well, so it's very hard to understand. But if you skip the equations, it's really interesting. Uh, and that becomes a bestseller. It's called Cybernetics. And he talks about the control of behavior in animals and machines. And he's arguing there's a fundamental similarity, in particular what's called negative feedback. So that means you've achieved a state, so you stop doing something. Uh, the simplest example of that is a toilet system. You flush it, the water goes out, and then it fills up, and all being well, it will stop filling when it gets to a certain point. And if you've never taken a toilet system apart, I recommend it. It is amazing. It's such a simple piece of technology and so important, and it functions according to negative feedback. But there's no electronics in it. But that is what is happening. There is feedback, negative feedback. I've achieved this state. I'm now full. I'm going to stop the water coming into the system. So Wiener thinks in all these kind of ways about how uh, behaviors might occur. And von Neumann, and he, they're all part of a group. They're all, as you can gather, all mathematicians. And they think initially they're gonna model the human brain and then an animal brain. And then they, von Neumann very quickly realizes that this is crazy. This will never work that there is, it's just far, 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 you know, he says something like, you know, if we could do this, our machine would be bigger than the known universe, which is probably right. I mean, you've got to remember there were no transistors at this point, uh, never mind integrated circuits, everything was done with valves, but even with integrated circuits, you'd still need a, a machine vast, you know, bigger, bigger than the galaxy to be able to do it. Um, so von Neumann, but that, that's his idea. That's all part of these ideas, this link between technology and behavior and brains. And maybe there's some underlying functions that we can understand uh, that are common to all these machines and to uh, and to humans. Now, this idea has kind of gone out of fashion. Cybernetics isn't so the best bits of it have been integrated into uh, neuroscience, mm -hmm. the way that people understand the circuits being uh, wired together. But the final bit of my book addresses the problem of what can I do? Can Sorry, I make a request? Yes. Sir, actually, uh, my network is a bit bad, and also I want to discuss this thing about the present and the future of the neuroscience in a bit detail. So, can okay. we schedule the discussion somewhere else? Sorry? Can we schedule the discussion somewhere else? The yeah, present yeah, sure. and the future? Sure. I mean, whenever you want.